Yeah, I think that might be the best. We're uh, the oh, let's just be transparent. We're having like uh, presentations, but we want to also be able to see our notes at the same time, so that we don't just ramble on and waste your guys' day. So just bear with us real quick. But I can go ahead and introduce the general uh, theme and concept, and also the panelists involved. Um, hello, hi, welcome to the last day of the IGF. We all made it. Round of applause for yourselves. Um, I think we're 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 going to be very. Uh, brief on technical terms here, but we're just going to be introducing something called the Dow Model Law and a group coalition called Koala. And Koala is a, a multidisciplinary research and collaboration firm. It gathers lawyers, academics, computer scientists, and uh, entrepreneurs with a collaborative mindset. Um, we were researching together the challenges and opportunities of decentralized technologies and their impact on specifically law and society and creating um, uh, you know, actionable steps forward for legal recognition of uh, entities that, that are known as DAOs, which are called Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. So a little bit about the Koala panelists. I'm not sure I can see everyone that's online, but uh, assuming that we're all here. Um, this is. So online somewhere is uh, my good friend Rick Dudley, and he's in uh, New York City, and he is a, honestly, Rick's pretty, pretty freaking cool. He's got like 20 years of just building the craziest uh, intercommunication technologies and helping design standards across a number of different technical fields, um, and he is a uh, founder of a project called uh, Laconic and Vulcanize, and he's just, you know, he's a really real guy, so it's going to be a little bit blunt stuff from him. I'm excited for it. Uh, over there, doing a little coordination, we have Fatsumi Panadeira, and she is a badass lawyer and has worked on a number of different uh, decentralized technologies as a general counsel, leading counsel, and is also one of the uh, authors of the paper that we're going to be discussing today, uh, mo the model law. This right here, this person, is Silke. They're going to be facilitating the presentation, walking you guys through, as, as we can, the uh, Dow model law. And we've scaled it down and made it very applicable to just specifically what we like want to focus on with legality and society. And I believe we have, oh, maybe everybody, how's it going? Uh, then we have Morshed. And Morshed, uh, actually, you, now that you're up here, do you want to introduce yourselves, Rick and Morshed? <laughs> I'll start with you, Morshed. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Morshed. I'm a, a lawyer and a legal academic. I'm currently based at the European University Institute in Florence, working on the Blockchain Gov project. I'm also um, a member of Koala and uh, had the great pleasure of uh, co-authoring the DAO model law with Silke, Fatima, Rick, and I think I see Greg as well. Uh, Greg. It's uh, a pleasure to be able to be here today, even if it's only online. Well, the point of this conference is that the online participation is just as important as in-person participation. So uh, Rick, do you want to give a quick better update about who you are and what you believe in, how your life is going? Or do you want me to continue to, uh, to do that? Unmute, unmute. Unmute, Rick. Hi, yeah, I'm Rick. Um, I think the uh, very good um, intro, thank you. Um, I'll just sort of add primarily a mechanism designer in the blockchain space. Um, and that's sort of how I ended up working with Koala on the DAO model law. Um, and I uh, work with a lot of DAOs um, as well, just as part of my uh, professional capacity. Awesome. Uh, and myself, I am Jarrell James. I will be moderating this panel and hopefully not uh, messing it up. So I come from a space of uh, decentralized technologies as well. Also have a history in computational chemistry. And I am co-founder of a project called Internet Alliance with Fatima Fanazeda over there. And we're focused on internet resiliency uh, infrastructure and different strategies with which to achieve that for various populations, what, depending on what their needs may be. So without further ado, which I don't actually know what that sentence means, um, let's just start off with a quick question. 
does anyone, I think we already asked, has anyone heard of Del Mar a lot? And the answer was no, right? Yeah. It was a yes? Who was it? Hmm? Hmm? I've seen some nods. Yeah, some <laughs> nods, okay. Um, I think maybe we could just highlight some main points on this. And like the Dow model law is a lot of work towards, I think, something that's been frustrating a, a, a good portion of society inside of the, the hyper-technical space that's trying to push forward decentralized technologies. There is uh, overwhelmingly a wall that people run into, which is being recognized as legal entities or finding some kind of meaningful legal pathway to interact with, whether it be municipal authorities, um, corporations, and uh, international coalitions. So um, this is maybe a good way to go into why it took three years and a little bit about what it is from Silke. Hi guys. Um, I think most of you have, if you're here in this um, presentation, you've heard about DAOs. They represent um, a new form of um, coordination and collaboration um, that has not uh, consisted until very recently. Um, and it um, is an opportunity, especially for um, people, or the for global organizations, and a few, many of you are from global orga organizations, um, to actually look into this uh, coordination form that goes beyond um, companies. Um, it's an opportunity for large-scale coordination and it's desperately needed, as you can see from the recent geopolitical changes um, for this increasingly multipolar world. Um, they do fa face, uh, as Gerald just said, they do face uh, significant uh, legal uncertainties um, that can be very detrimental uh, to their development. Um, and Rick, if you could uh, just move to the next slide. So why do we need the model law? It's, um, there's a need for these organizations to have a legal personality um, and capacity. Just click, click it through, um, if you could. Um, so that um, DAOs can actually um, interact and interface with the off-chain world. Um, companies do have limited liability um, and that's why they are so successful. This is not the case for DAOs and um, to, de however they need this to protect um, the contributors, and you might have seen there has been quite a few, uh, there has been a lot, um, not a lot, but some jurisprudence on the topic. And this has been going on for the last three years, and we need to look I continue to look into this. Um, there is a need for legal personality so that DAOs actually have um, standing, um, for example, to sign contracts or to sue in court. There is also a need to resolve taxation issues because at this moment in time, a lot of those uh, DAOs, they're not registered anywhere. That means they do not pay taxes anywhere. That needs to uh, find a solution. And then there's also overall generally an, a need for a legal certainty and predictability. Um, again, to uh, interface with the off-chain world. Um, People have asked us, and uh, several jurisdictions around the world, what they've done, they have actually um, trying to make their jurisdiction more hospitable to DAOs. Um, and they, you know, or people ask us, why do we not just incorporate in a company, in LLC, just a corporation? Shouldn't that be enough? Why are we actually, um, you know, pushing for something uh, new? And um, the, the, the reason for, uh, for that is, and Rick, if you just move one further. Um, next slide, please. Um, we can summarize that, and I've just said that already. It's basically DAOs are transnational, pseudo-anonymous, um, autonomous. And actually, they are incorporated, and they are incorporated on the blockchain. Um, which is decentralized, secure, and temper resistant. And the question then becomes, why do they need to be incorporated in a company's register? Um, to address all these points, what we did is, over the last three years, we worked on this model law. Um, and um, the model law has, we should start with that. Actually, we want to go into problems we have faced since then. But the, the model law uh, is premised on two concepts or two principles. 
Um, the first one is functional equivalence. And Rick, if you move over to the next slide, it'd be great. Um, it's functional equivalence and regulatory equivalence. These get mixed up quite a lot. Um, they're two different concepts, but very similar. So the first one, functional equivalence, is between the tools and the techs, tech to be to um, comply with specific legal rules. So uh, what are the tools that are available to actually fulfill whatever the text says? So for example, you have wet, wet signatures and you have easy signatures. And then um, the even more important concept is regulatory equivalence, which is between the means used to achieve a regulatory objective. So um, as an example, the deployment of a smart contract on the blockchain with all the relevant di data uh, about the DAO um, might not be functionally equivalent. In fact, it is not uh, functionally equivalent to registration into a corporate register, but its regulatory policy objectives um, of publicity and certainty are um, fully achieved, or we at least think that it fully achieved this goal. Um, and based on those principles, we uh, came up with this model law, and Fatema is going to continue on this. Hello. Yes. Um, uh, Rick, if you can follow up on the next slide, I'm still going to present on this slideshow. So uh, what you're going to see soon on the slide is, thank you. Um, so this is the structure of the model law uh, that we drafted, which is itself like a 50-page document with the commentary. Um, and I'm not going to really enter into the details of the various chapters, but you can see that it basically tackles all of the points that we traditionally pay attention to in um, corporate formation. So it being um, rights and obligations and um, the purpose or activity of the entity, um, the governance requirements uh, that would lead to fulfilling the minimum conditions uh, to have uh, legal personality and limited liability. Some exceptions to that as we also have in the corporate world, um, some other rules about internal governance. Um, we uh, highlighted the absence of implicit fiduciary duty for any uh, one decision maker within that novel form of organization, uh, because this is one of the big risks um, that uh, people who are involved with DAOs um, are uh, concerned about, whether or not they will be considered as a fiduciary and then bear the responsibility for whatever the activity of that entity is. Um, but if the DAO has been granted legal personality and limited liability, then there is uh, this absence of fiduciary as well uh, within uh, the scope of that model law. And then we further went on to discuss particular provisions about the nature of the blockchain itself, uh, which if you're familiar with, um, like can be for instance forked, so like people can move away from a blockchain into a, like another version of it and so on. So these are very technical uh, possibilities that um, are exist but in very different forms in the corporate world. So we had to tackle these problematics there. And then we have some um, other provisions and briefly deal with tags, which is something that we couldn't really satisfyingly uh, cover within the DAO model law because it's so jurisdiction specific. Uh, Rick, please, the next slide. And now, um, so we wrote this a few years ago, published it, and then what happened since? Um, and <laughs> usually th this guy moves around and is like lost and looks um, for an answer or for where is the adoption. And um, so the adoption um, is uh, has to be put in the global context of the fact that when uh, we wrote that model law and published it, it was quite early, even in the technical space, for DAOs to ma mature and also for legal space, like the jurisdictions, to grasp this novel form of entity and uh, understanding and decide like how they want to regulate it, if even they want to regulate it, and should they want to regulate it, then uh, whether this should be through, for instance, implementing the model law or um, just finding uh, other ways. And since the publication of the model law, 
we've seen um, many like developments in various jurisdictions. So the three first ones that are listed of uh, Vermont, Wyoming, and Marshall Islands have decided to tackle uh, the question of um, their relationship or their jurisdiction's relationship with this novel form of entities through um, a vision that is not the one of the model law, but is uh, very important to pay attention to. So they, for instance, decided that uh, this DAO, in order to interact with um, the legal system and other corporations and, um, and just the bureaucracy overall um, of their jurisdictions and then globally through their jurisdictions, then they have to, for instance, incorporate an entity there or somehow incorporate their DAO entity within that jurisdiction through some novel form they came up with. Um, then this obviously has like drawbacks. So to understand like the, the attempts here is that, I, I like to, to give this example that blockchain and DAOs, they speak their own language. Like it's a novel form of association between individuals who decide that to pull together some form of treasury or asset and govern it in a global way that is novel like in comparison to what we've been doing so far that like association is usually amongst people done within like a geographical zone, so a country, a jurisdiction, an internet and our like hyper connectivity and whatever um, opportunities that the blockchain technology offers allows people to interconnect and join within a purpose in a more global scale. And this language is not actually spoken by the language of our legal system yet. So for these two um, systems to interact, we need to somehow bridge this interaction and Vermont, Wyoming and so on try to do it through this like incorporation method. But then um, the model law has also been considered by other jurisdictions and implemented at the adapted and implemented only in one so far. Um, here you can see that like Australia has analyzed it, the United Kingdom, it appeared um, in uh, one of their uh, works. St. Helena is um, considering it, New, Ham New Hampshire as well, but the state of Utah in the United States decided to actually adopt, adopt and adapt the model law appro approach. Um, but it did make some modification to that. And if, uh, Rick, you go to the next slide, please. Um, so Utah, what they did is that they took the model law and tried to fit it in within their own jurisdiction and system that is currently existing. And for that, they had to make adaptations, of course. Um, but one of the features of um, the model law that is very core to the whole exercise that Utah parted with is um, the one where in the model law, we do not require registration of the DAO. So the, the sole fact that it exists and fulfills the conditions of the model law should suffice for it to be recognized and granted legal um, personality, while in the state of Utah they said, yes, but it also needs to register within our jurisdiction. Uh, Rick, please, the next slide. Um, so here is just um, um, like a screenshot of uh, the bill, if any of you wants to look for, uh, further uh, and, and read the bill. Next slide, please. Um, and this is a screenshot of that registration provision um, where it says that uh, it has to nominate one registered agent uh, within the state of Utah. So I think that what they were attempting to is having like a point of connection within the jurisdiction in order to speak to that DAO entity. Um, so I can break here if any of you have questions so far or otherwise we move to. Oh. Um, yeah, I think we should just stop here for a second and like maybe help everyone like what did we all just hear? What was like, what was, what was this um, as a full review? Um, so like we are talking about decentralized autonomous organizations. These organizations are, can be collectives of people, but I think maybe more relevantly for the IGF, it could also be coalitions of companies or orgs um, that are all coming together under a shared mission. And that shared mission uh, re would require them to have some kind of uh, legal interaction with various bodies uh, around the planet. And I think what you guys have just done really well is explain all of that, but also the 
the issues with where this philosophy tends to run up against a wall, and that is the oftentimes these jurisdictions. Um, if anybody does have any thoughts, I would encourage you to start maybe thinking about your own governments and maybe your own jurisdictional uh, issues that you've considered, and yeah, get your get your questions uh, ready for us for later. But um, yeah, I think if we want to move into really explaining the first challenge might be might be good and we can like the first challenge of, of the DAO model law going forward and uh, from there I think we can also take into account audience participation of maybe other challenges that you may think could be propping up in your own places or could pop up in um, examples you've seen in the past so I'll hand it over I think one important factor uh, we have we, we have prepared two challenges. Um, the reason we come with this challenge here is because a here at, at IGF you have a lot of government um, in um, officials and governments that consider um, DAO legislation. Um, what we face with Utah is basically they adopted the model law wholesale with a few exceptions, but for this um, registration requirement. But the core of the model law is actually not too hard for a DAO to have to register um, because they are global entities. Um, we've ourselves wondered why this I is the case um, and what we can do to, um, to improve the model law because we're working on a version two. Um, the registration requi uh, requ requirement Basically, what we said, we, we had earlier the, the equivalence, the functional equivalence and the regulatory equivalence um, principles. We feel that um, the publication on the blockchain, the registration on the blockchain, the publication requirements and all the qui requirements we put into the model law in relation to that is um, regulatorily um, equivalent to registration in a jurisdiction, but it seems that this is not the case for Utah and also other jurisdictions we have talked to. So I actually want to just do a little bit of uh, audience participation on this. It's like, what would somebody th think is one of the biggest hesitations of why they would want to interact with a single person or have someone, s a single entity, single person registered in their jurisdictions? Um, just like raise your hand and, and, and ask or answer that question if you want. But um, we have, I think a lot of people tend to tell us like, you know, it's because of liability, it's because of liability, it's because of liability. And I don't believe that that is exactly where, where it actually comes from, from these governing bodies. That's not what their concern is. I mean, one, uh, one other issue that um, usually is the elephant, the white elephant in the room is uh, the taxation. Like without registration or jurisdictions that r currently consider making um, a hospitable environment for DAOs, um, they, and I, this is, m I wonder, this is basically because um, of the th they want to have tax money. They want to have a benefit from it, and they feel that there might not be a benefit if they do not require the uh, registered agents or regist um, or general other um, formation requirement in their own jurisdiction. I'm very much interested to hear your opinion on that, um, because obviously within the model also um, that would. This could be dealt with new, a different taxation um, rule on DAOs. Yeah, and I just want to give quick uh, our participants online a chance to, to tune in here. Uh, Morshad is uh, very well versed on the equivalence issue, and I would love to just give you the floor, Morshad, and just discuss maybe some of your own insights around these, these, uh, these tensions. Thank you. Um, I won't take up uh, too, mu too much time, especially given the very uh, comprehensive and thorough um, presentation that's been given, as well as the uh, interventions that have already been made. Um, but I think in addition to taxation, one of the issues that we found as a challenge when it comes to um, establishing regulatory equivalence has been um, what are considered to be like incorporation fees, um, which is, a, I guess, a type of tax or is a type of um, levy that uh, a state expects uh, an entity to pay when they're filing. Um, and we 
anticipated that, you know, the revenue implications would be something that they would take into account. But in the transposition process, this was quite a, a eye-opening aspect of it that um, this came up again and again um, as, a, as a discussion point. So I think um, going forward, when we look at um, different jurisdictions to, to work with with respect to the model law, the issue of um, how, like regulatory equivalents cannot just take into account trying to meet a policy objective, but has to, you know, hands-on take into account these sorts of financial considerations as well. And whether um, some other way of trying to meet these considerations, whether that is um, having a, a pool of assets uh, that, you know, um, is kept to, you know, pay for these sorts of uh, fees. Um, it could be something that's done individually. It could be done as a guy unregistered DAO as a group. Um, there are many creative approaches that can be taken to to, to do this. Um, but basically that just trying to satisfy a policy uh, objective wouldn't be um, sufficient. The other point that I want to add is that in addition to this issue of registration, registered agents and so on, um, there's also been a discussion about the role of accreditation. So who is going to actually verify that the different points that are mentioned for formation in the Dow model law, who gets to actually accredit that this is happening, who gets to audit it and so on. And we found that different jurisdictions have different views about uh, who this should be. Um, some have said that, okay, a private uh, accreditation body that sort of does this um, assessment uh, is fine, while others have said, no, we would want to have uh, some entity in our state, something that the uh, state authorities trust, uh, to be able to do this so that they know that these formation requirements have been met. And again, so this will be an issue to consider when we try to establish regulatory equivalence in other contexts. And yeah, I, I'll hand it over to uh, Rick or anyone else who would like to add to this. Or yeah, back to you. I think that was a really solid uh, just overview. And I want to like, you know, keep us a little bit for moving forward on this because I think this uh, regulatory question is just going to come up again in this next little bit. Because I think what we're not discussing is yes, while we're not fulfilling maybe the philosophical background and ideologies of these municipal authorities or these governing bodies, there is also a moment where they're not fulfilling the actual decentralized ideology and the purpose of having these decentralized organizations um, be able to collaborate in a both a uh, mathematically ledgered way on the blockchain and also in a way that allows for a number of different stakeholders to combine themselves under one coalition and demand recognition on that basis. And why I wanted to bring up the con, uh, conflicting philosophies then around this for, for DAOs is um, I think a really important part of DAOs is, and the ideology around that is that people want to be able to make movements in a private and secure environment. And privacy by its nature is, I think we're learning, is kind of anti-state in some ways. I think that there's a desire to kind of eradicate true privacy on the digital sphere. And DAOs represent a collective movement that is also trying to maintain the privacy of some of its members and, and not put them in positions of compromise. So I wanted to like hand it over to you um, to start off on like the challenge two and discuss where privacy fits into all of this. Uh, Fatime. Um, thanks. Hello, yes, now it works. Um, thank you for this. So uh, I, I was going to comment actually on the previous challenge um, just to cite some case laws, but um, your prompt actually uh, requires a response because you said that privacy is anti-state. And I think this is fundamentally not the case. Actually, privacy and our right to privacy is a constitutional right in most of the places and it's actually why uh, it's, it's very aligned with state mission. So privacy is not anti-state, but this is part of the current narrative that we are hearing more and more that like privacy threatens some of our other rights. So privacy needs to be compromised with in order to protect uh, and like sustain anti-money laundering rules, for instance. So um, privacy should suffer, encryption should suffer in the context of messaging apps, for instance, to protect the rights of 
um, other populations um, against some form of harmful content that can uh, go through these apps and so on. So um, privacy as a right, I think, is not under question because it cannot be, I think, legitimately questioned. But um, here there is the question of whether privacy primes over these other rights, or even if, uh, like, I even wonder whether this is an actual legitimate question in itself. Like, is this a dichotomy between should we protect privacy or should we protect our, um, like, against terrorism financing and money laundering? I think that this is a false dichotomy um, that m forces us to choose one over the other, while I believe that we can protect both and we should aim to protect both and fulfill all of our rights um, without like harming one for uh, a certain narrative. Yes, Silky, I want to hear your response, and then and then Rick, Rick online, who is a uh, deep professional in the privacy uh, design space. I'd love to hear just a, a couple minutes of thoughts uh, following Silke. Just give him a one two. One one thing I wanted to add is obviously right now because but at DAOs and we haven't mentioned this DAOs are premise on transparency, meaning that everything is transparent right now. And it's actually, I'm not sure DAOs are actually advancing privacy at all. It's the opposite. They are not advancing privacy. They have been undermining it, and we are trying to get it back. Also, the model law as it stands right now actually is based premised on transparency and how transparent everything is, and that leads to regulatory and functional equivalence. And now um, we've seen uh, several um, bad results out of that. One is, for example, that DAO workers, um, their right to have privacy of um, payment is being undermined because they're getting paid by the DAO. We ca everyone can see they are paid like X, amount, whereas anyone who works for a company just has this privacy. No one necessarily sees a person's bank account. So what we're trying to do is trying to get privacy back into um, the model law, and that was I is a challenge um, because DAOs are usually associated um, with, um, I mean, they're, uh, they're squarely in the cryptocurrency space, and there are KYC rules, and you know, um, anti-money laundering l rules and regulators would love DAOs at least to stay transparent while we're trying to get this back to a certain extent. Yeah, Rick, I, I, I think you're online. I actually really I love the, uh, a, a, a bit you were just saying about how DAOs are more transparent than the, s the salaries of CEOs and the salaries of like all these different corporate entities and their officers. And that transparency does seem to be lost on regulatory authorities. Like when you show them, tell them that there's a ledger and there's this public transparency, I don't know that there's a lot of understanding around that. Um, so I yeah, just go respond and then yeah, Rick, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the design for these sorts of uh, pieces. Yeah, um, I think there's a lot of issues around privacy. I think. Um, there is this sort of fundamental misunderstanding when talking, in my experience, and talking to regulators or, or sort of hearing the arguments of regulators secondhand, maybe more precisely. They seem to believe that the medium somehow is special and has these special properties that require a special treatment, and I, and I think that that's very misguided. I think that you, the medium uh, being internet communication, frankly, and, and signed, cryptographically signed messages, not even encrypted messages, really shouldn't, should be a simple enough mechanism that, that it, we should be able to educate regulators on how existing laws and existing protections and existing regulations can be applied um, in a way that's you know both satisfies the requirements of the existing uh, online community as well as uh, the regulators and and so for me a lot of these privacy conversations are you know to Silke's point you know why are we giving up um, privacy uh, there's a technical limitation there's sort of a engineering practicality that's causing that at the moment but we shouldn't uh, expect that to persist uh, in perpetuity and we should be able to uh, uh, much like Fatima was saying, we, sh we should be able to um, 
you know, have the, the privacy that we're constitutionally um, guaranteed. And I, and I think that that's actually maybe the bigger issue is that there is an internal struggle within any, any government that I'm aware of where they, they want to know what people are doing in spite of the fact that there is a constitution or some other legal uh, constraint on their ability to do that inspection. And I feel like this is just sort of classic traditional um, internet privacy issues. It, it's not really distinct. Uh, the dial privacy issues aren't aren't really that distinct from normal, um, you know, surveillance compromises. I guess you could call them because surveillance still occurs. We can't really avoid it. Um, I think. Just touching on that, you were saying that there are, we shouldn't give this up and there are ways to reconcile this. I fully agree, I think we all do. And I just would like to clarify that I think what what uh, uh, is striking to me is that as things move towards the digital space, now we are starting to see this idea or this perpetuation that privacy is anti-state. And I, that's kind of where I'm, I'm, I'm coming from on that. I'd like to just quickly discuss like, any ideas on how we would reconcile these kinds of differences and what's going on in model law number two, our version two, and like what maybe approaches are being taken around reconciling these uh, mildly ideological differences? That's an open question to any of the panelists if you'd like it, but uh, I just take it. Hello. Yeah. Um, Dafkin attempts to m to recreate um, the uh, privacy that a normal bank account or like the payment into a bank account by a company would give you. Um, I'm probably not the right person because that's from a that that was uh, the technical team just developed earlier. There is actually a blog post about that, but it was. Uh, uh just about that one little point, um, how can DAO workers get paid without everyone know what, how much money they get and on, on what regular basis uh, they get the funds? Um, it was, uh, and you might have seen this if you're in the space in relation to um, privacy pools. Um, what it does is you, you send the funds into Am I the right person to, s to talk about this? Maybe Rick wants to talk about that. Yeah, but Rick, Rick but can talk about the privacy pools. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm capable of talking a little bit about privacy pools. I mean, I understand the, the underlying technology uh, well enough. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's so in fact, um, I, uh, I so should, probably should have mentioned this earlier. So I, I run a company, uh, it's a registered company in the United States. I pay my taxes. Uh, we get paid on chain by uh, various blockchain foundations. Uh, I put those payments through Tornado Cash, um, you know, specifically for this reason to uh, add some financial privacy uh, to the um, my my uh, my employees. Frankly, who get paid this way, I thought it was a bit bizarre and invasive that um, that you know anyone in the world could see what they're being paid. There's also a security issue that I'm always sensitive to: physical security issue of people knowing how much you're getting paid. Um, and so I use Tornado Cash and, that, and I'm happy to, uh, you know, I still have all of my notes and what have you. I can prove to any regulator that I, I was not a terrorist. I paid myself and what have you. Um, but all of the sort of rigmarole and controversy around that, um, even prior to some of these uh, other claims about funding terrorism uh, that have also come up, um, again, it's, it's just a lot of confusion. It's a lot of a regulator sort of uh, applying, you know, trying to hammer in a screw um, I, I just, I think a lot of these problems, um, so, so, so privacy pools are just a, a technology that are, that is really just trying to get you back to the basic level of privacy that you would have had otherwise. So basically being able to say, um, I sent this transaction in private, um, to someone else. And now, um, some regulator asks me, uh, or, or, or somehow requires that, um, only certain types of transactions uh, actually make it onto like the the payment rail, for example, like the uh, the fiat payment rail. Um, privacy pools are a technology that allows you to um, have privacy when you're transacting, but then reveal it, uh, you know, upon request and demonstrate that you are not that that your funds never uh, were tainted by um, 
funds that are that are otherwise restricted or regulated. All right, thank you. I think in the last uh, few minutes, I want to ask the panel, and I think it'll be more fun if we do a little bit of a, a hypothetical situation. So let's each person, uh, let's imagine you are talking to the lead regulator of, let's say, a, a major world power. What is something that you would want to like get across to them and what is like the call to action to those of the legal practitioners of that government around this Dow model law that you would just, if you had five minutes in an elevator? Thanks, I can, I can go first maybe. Um, I think that it's not about lead power of the world actually. This is a global technology that knows no borders and it should not be primarily like regulated by one uh, like so-called lead power. Um, I think that uh, what I would want to tell all of the regulators and practitioners who are interested in this space is not to rush into regulating or trying to capture through uh, or shape this technology to regulating right now because uh, the technology itself is still growing organically and we need to give it space to grow. And I believe that all of the regulation that already exists, like whether it is like anti-fraud regulation or securities regulation and so on, do grasp some of the activities that may be problematic within the technology and we do not need new form of regulation right now. What we need is a sandbox. We need to give the possibility for this technology to mature and um, what we've heard often during the past days here is like, how will the internet look like in 20 years? And I think that the internet would definitely look different in 20 years and it will probably, and I think I've heard that also often, which was uh, positively surprising that uh, it will be probably decentralized or, or, or have more decentralized com components. And if for that to materialize in a positive way, I think that we need to care for less capture right now and more sandboxing in order for this regulation to deliver on its promise. Uh, Rick and Rashad, uh, just a couple closing thoughts. Uh, let's try and keep it to uh, you know two minutes. Um, yeah, so just briefly, um, just to sort of mirror that um, previous comment, I, I strongly believe that most of what we're doing uh, in this space with DAOs uh, fits under existing regulation, the vast, vast, vast majority. There might be one or two exceptions that I can't even really think of right now. Um, and it's sort of, I feel, frankly, as a taxpayer, I feel it's the responsibility of the regulators to educate themselves and understand how these technologies work so that they can then apply the law uh, judiciously um, to new technology. And I'm happy to help them with that. I'm you know, there's plenty of people who are who are interested in, in helping and supporting that, but I don't think that we need to create a lot of excessive new laws. Um, I think it causes more problems than it fixes. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, Morshad, uh, let's give you an opportunity here. Uh, two minutes. I just I, I just wanted to add that um, we're starting to see case law emerging, as has been alluded to. Um, that starts looking at DAOs. And in some cases, um, this isn't, is, is basically trying to achieve regulation by enforcement of uh, certain existing laws. And as we've, uh, as we've started to see, um, in some cases, this can lead to um, all manner of unintended consequences, especially if um, this, let's say, gets appealed to uh, uh, an appellate court where there is um, a decision that's made that, that creates uh, precedent. And I think issues that we've raised in the model law, uh, ranging from um, whether there should be implicit uh, fiduciary duties or uh, you know, questions of tort, all the way to issues of um, you know, how to deal with the limited liability or joint and several liability, the, the risk of this has to be something that um, we should also try to proactively shape in the types of regulatory sandboxes that Fatima mentioned, hopefully with the idea that um, judges will eventually also come in on board to start interpreting uh, the law in a way that doesn't end up constraining this space and creating new sorts of harms because while we wait or to wait, to wait and see this might, this risk might also emerge. 
my last comment would be um, to state that even if um, regulators or re um, jurisdictions do not want to implement the model law, because of course there are a lot of issues with it too, at least get rid of the um, the default um, characterization of DAOs as general partnership or unincorporated associations that gives joint and several liabilities to any of the contributors. Um, and this is this is one of the things we have seen recently, which had a very chilling chilling effect, uh, chilling not chilling, chilling uh, coldening effect on uh, DAO contributions and how um, and the developing of code for DAOs. You've s we've seen this in two in uh, especially in the UKI case in the US recently. This really needs to go away. So even if you think the model law is nothing for you, you need to address this in your jurisdiction because if you don't, um, you're not going to have much development in the area anymore. Yeah, I completely <laughs> echo those sentiments. Code is code as a by its own self is not uh, a crime and i want to just like you know bring this all together because i know that legal frameworks and regulation can be very dry in like understanding the future and you know, okay well how does this actually you know apply to the future and there's a lot of coordination um systems that have existed before DAOs, and this is just another innovation in the concept of coordination systems and i think what the model law has done and koala is trying to do is to push forward the the um, field of innovation, uh, innovative solutions around coordination, and while maintaining uh, a lot of new and exciting technologies, such as blockchain, such as decentralized um, infrastructure and uh, organizations. So, like for relative relativity towards this event, there's a lot of civil societies here. There's a lot of people that could be coming together and making their own coalitions. And for those online that are watching, I'm sure we've all seen. Um, a lot of frustration inside of move making movements on the planet and trying to make changes inside of different jurisdictions. So I'm really excited to see Dao Marla version two. And um, yeah, we'll be around and feel free to discuss uh, th your governments for us, but you know, send them our way. <laughs> uh, thank you.